youtube.com slash Stu is the place to go. Use the promo code Stu to save 10 bucks. If you're watching on YouTube, like the video right now. And I would say, uh, special advice, subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications. We have some really cool things we're doing on the YouTube channel. They're going to be a little bit different coming up very, very soon. So do not miss it. Doug Gowdy joins us from New York with the latest on the immigration crisis in New York. Our favorite Canadian teacher with gigantic prosthetic boobs has a brand new job. We'll tell you all about that. But we start by doing the racism vaccine. Yes, the racism vaccine. It's in effect today. We want to discuss what that vaccine is and how it works. Let's start in Jacksonville. Gunman kills three and himself in racially motivated shooting. Uh, really the big story over the weekend which, I don't know, seems a little strange to me. Uh, Joe Biden denounced the shooting in Jacksonville. White supremacy has no place in America. And I think at this point, like, he said that the first time there was a shooting, and now they're just using AI to, like, blur the background and change his mouth a little bit to change the details. I don't even think he's making this speech anymore. He just, bl he just bl blurts it out no matter what the circumstances are. This one in particular is a situation where the shooter does seem to be uh, a racist. Now, he left several manifestos. Uh, a lot of them had real racist language in it. Not exclusively racist language, also like just insane ramblings. That's not to say that uh, racists, of course, can't be insane. But sometimes people who are insane also just say racist things. There's a difference between that person and, you know, um, I don't know, uh, Richard Spencer or something, right? That is like a guy who thinks he's an academic talking about racial issues. This is, it seems like it was an insane person who also had crazy racial thoughts. But whatever, I'm totally fine uh, summarizing this as a, a, a racist shooting, and it does seem like it fits that bill. Now, of course, that's the only reason you know about it. It's the only reason you know about that shooting at all is because a white racist shot black people in a, in a store. It's a really horrible, horrible story. Could have been seemingly worse as the guy went to a historically black college and was going to shoot up the college, it seems like, got snagged before he did it. They alerted authorities. He ran away. When he ran away, he went to the store and shot three people and then himself. And we can all unite in the happiness that he, at least, is gone. Um, now, this is a serious story. It's important to understand that it's a, the tragedy is real. And if you happen to have a family member or if you were in that community, you would be absolutely devastated. It would be the only thing on your mind. I, I, a foregone conclusion that that is true. Secondarily, it is important to note that in many databases of mass shootings, this doesn't even meet the qualification of mass shooting. In fact, if it wasn't for the racism element of this, there's no way you'd know about the story. There's no way it would be a national news story. If a, a black person killed three black people in Atlanta, you would not hear about it. If a white person killed three white people in Dallas, you would not hear about it. It would not be a national news story at all. It's only a national news story because it helps serve a further narrative, which is that all white people are racist and constantly trying to kill black people. Uh, for some reason, the media wants to tell you that all the time. Even though it's not true, the media wants you to believe it. So they will tell it to you and the president will glom onto it and try to do everything that we can uh, to for forward that story. It's important to know that it's not, it's not the reality of most people's lived experience. It is not the reality of living in America. America, generally speaking, is a pretty darn good place to live. One reason you know that is because hundreds of thousands of people seem to come across the border every month. There's a reason why people want to come here. And you know what? You think, oh, well, they must all be white supremacists from Mexico. No. Many times they happen to have different colored skin and they still want to come here to take advantage of what it's like to live in this country. It's a great place to be, and it's not a place where you're constantly being hunted if you happen to look different than the old white guy who's in the off Oval Office right now. It's important to note that. But I will say, it's, normally we just go to, if there wasn't a racial shooting here, we would just go to guns. But that became very difficult this weekend when the sheriff of Jacksonville decided to talk about this and explain who the real problem was. Well, we have to stop people that have bad intentions. Guns is... The, the story is always about guns. It's, the people are bad. This guy's a bad guy. If I could take my gun off right now and I lay it on this counter, nothing will happen. It'll sit there. But as soon as a wicked person grabs a hold of that handgun and starts shooting people with it, there's the problem. The problem is the individual. 
Now, guns are a tool that people use to do 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 horrible things, but um, it's the individuals that that wield these things. So we we are working hard to try to to try to stop that. But in this situation, in this case, there was nothing saying there was nothing illegal about him owning the owning the firearms. We work so hard to try to find different things to blame in an incident like this. And I want to get to kind of the, the, un, the current here that, that sets this situation up in a second. But when you look at this incident in and of itself, the person to blame is the person that actually shot people. That's the, I mean, I, that might be a boring story to you. I mean, I don't know. Everyone seems to be bored by that. Everyone seems to be like, oh, well, that's just, of course, whatever. That's just the person. Yeah, you know, individual responsibility actually matters. And so when someone's going to get blamed for an incident like this, this is just, uh, just to let you guys know, the person who did it is the person who should be blamed. And we can talk about societal and, and cultural reasons behind these issues as well, and, and it's important to look at that stuff. It's important to look at his motivation as well. It's, it's important to know why this person believes that they did it, so you can try to eliminate that thought process from somebody else. But when we look to blame, the person to blame is the person who actually pulled the trigger. And so rarely do we even talk about that person anymore. Now, the media, of course, is looking for people to blame as well. They don't really care about the person who pulled the trigger. I mean, obviously, they think he's evil, as he is. They're correct on that. But they really want to blame Republicans. and They really want to blame uh, evil white supremacy, which, by the way, they conflate completely. And I reject this premise completely. They are not the same thing. Just because someone is racist does not mean they are right wing. That is not how this works. I completely reject that. I am a conservative. I am on the right. I am not a racist. I don't want to. I don't want to be friends with anyone who is a racist. I think it's nonsense. And what it is, when you really focus on it, is collectivism. Racism is collectivism. It's a way of looking at the world. It's a way of grouping people into their little subsections instead of looking at them as people. I prefer to judge people as individuals, as I believe you do as well, or you probably wouldn't be here watching this show right now. It's really important to me. In fact, it's the most important thing to me. And I think the most important thing when it comes to the foundation of American culture with a possible, you know, uh, maybe unless you're going to the heavens uh, for, uh, for that uh, guidance, individualism, individual rights is really, really important. Making sure that people are judged as individuals. So, I mean, think about it. It's, it's such a founding principle that it was like, we overthrew the system of kings and king, queens and princes and, and titles like lord and lady and all of these things. Why did we do that? So you wouldn't just get accepted as special when you weren't special. The whole point was, if you weren't special, your life is probably going to suck and you're going to not really accomplish much of anything. And it doesn't matter what your last name is. And then on the other side, if your last name is Mud, but you're really, really talented or you work really, really hard, you will make ground. That was the whole foundation of this country. And now it's completely dismissed. We can put people in groups. Now, of course, they wanted to blame uh, Republicans. Conveniently, the guy that they seem to... I, I mean, look, we all know they target Donald Trump a lot, probably more than anybody else in history. But oddly, secondarily, they are still targeting Ron DeSantis. They tell us that Donald Trump has this thing all wrapped up, yet they're constantly attacking Ron DeSantis at every turn. Florida Governor Ron DeSantis booed at a prayer vigil as hundreds mourn racist killings, which is a sad moment. There was a good moment, though, as well. A Jacksonville Democrat councilwoman stepped up and said, you know, hey, put parties aside. This is nonsense. And uh, she stood up for the governor. Uh, because, look, booing uh, the governor is ridiculous. Now, he has stepped up. He, he, you know, he, he, one thing about DeSantis is he's done a really good job in these sort of crisis moments. Uh, you know, buildings collapse, hurricanes roll in, shootings happen. He's been really, really an effective governor when it comes to these types of incidents. He's decided to pledge $1 million to the black college that was targeted uh, by the shooter. I guess that's his racism kicking in or something. Um, but it's fascinating to watch this. Now, of course... Another part that was really crazy to watch was the fact that we knew almost immediately that this guy was a racist, the shooter. Now, one thing, like, you don't always know, right? Usually what happens 
is an incident happens and people kind of like look around, they question, they can't figure out, they don't know what the motivation was. We see this all the time when it's an Islamic extremist. We might have an Islamic extremist, uh, maybe a guy who has a name that's very Islamic sounding. You, he's on social media saying all these extremist things and the media just will not com commit to it. No, no, we don't know what the cause could be. Maybe uh, his mail was delayed. He had an Amazon delivery. He's supposed to be overnight. It was coming in two days. That's why I did the shooting. Uh, nothing to do with him praising ISIS every day for the past six months. We can never jump to that conclusion. But they immediately were able to figure out that this particular shooter was racist. And by the way, I do believe that that is accurate. I think that's the, the, correct, um, uh, the correct summary of this story. He seemed to have, a, I think, a swastika painted on his gun. Kind of a head, yeah, kind, of, kind of nudgy a little bit and think, is this guy racist? Because he has a swastika on the gun. I don't know. Could it be an Amazon delivery issue? We don't know for sure. Um, now, the white gunman who killed three black people in Florida left behind several manifestos and used guns branded with swastikas. Several manifestos. We kind of know the content of it almost immediately, which is really, really fascinating. And was, you know, I think maybe your th first thought, maybe uh, it certainly was one of my first thoughts. It was also one of the first thoughts of Vivek Ramaswamy as he was doing the shows this weekend. Ramaswamy contrasts coverage of Jacksonville and Nashville shooting manifestos where months past the Nashville shooting manifesto where a trans person went in and just started shooting up children, we still don't have that manifesto. And we were told it was going to be very dangerous and it could cause all these problems because the problem, of course, is not the trans person doing the shooting of the Christian school. The problem is how Christians might react to that. So they might get upset because all of their children were murdered. So they might be mean to trans people uh, in other parts of the country or God knows what. So we can't actually have that one released, but we can release this one, which I, I don't know. Would you apply the same logic here? Either you think people react really negative to, negatively to manifestos or you don't. I mean, my belief is we should probably be able to access these things, though I'm not going to go into detail on you know, what these people's names are. I'm not going to give them the recognition they, they sort after, uh, they saw, they saw, they're uh, searching after. But I will say that uh, I would like to understand the motivation. I think that's uh, smart to do. And it's interesting as you look at the media, because the media, had the, they're much more subtle right, than the overt politicians who are out there saying these things. There's one politician I uh, heard earlier, uh, I was uh, on with Megyn Kelly today, and she played the audio, uh, I can't remember what the politician w it was, but just coming out and saying like, the blood is on Ron DeSantis' hands. Okay, that's just a dumb, like, that's dumb face first idiocy, right? We know that stuff exists. The booing of Ron DeSantis in the middle of a prayer vigil, that's dumb face first idiocy. It's overt idiocy. But the same thing is going on with the media, more covert idiocy. When they will do the same types of things, where they will try to paint this as a Ron DeSantis issue, they will ignore the double standard when it comes to manifestos. They will blame this on Republicans, not because the, there, there's nothing in the manifesto about, you know, our taxes are too high. We need to deregulate the energy industry. What makes you believe this is a right wing document, except for the fact that you've just taken racism and called it right wing? Racism is not right wing. Racism is identifying people by their characteristics and grouping them together and not judging them as individuals. Well, it's the total opposite of what I want. I want the opposite of that. And yet we're still branded with it over and over and over again. And it's a major, major problem. Steve Krakauer, who is the executive producer of Megan's show and has also been on this show many times, the author of a great book about the media, he put this out on, uh, on Twitter or X or whatever they're calling it today, which is a mass shooting flowchart. And it's too many boxes for me to read to you, but I, I encourage you, I've retweeted it. Go to uh, youtube.com slash, or excuse me, uh, twitter.com slash America, and there you will see this uh, mapped out. And I'll just give you a couple cents. Uh, you know, do you cover this? Well, uh, what race were the victims? If they were white and the perpetrator is not white, then no, you don't cover it. But can you make a gun control argument? Well, maybe you can. It's ex this, is, this covers every single scenario on how these guys cover this stuff. And it's, 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 you could, when you can put together it, it, it into a, a simple tweet, then I don't know, maybe it's not all that complicated. Maybe this is easier to pick apart than we all realize, and it is. It really is just simply the circle of grift over and over and over again. We've talked about this before. 
you need to vote Democrat. Well, why do you need to vote Democrat? Well, we need to stop racism. Well, is it stopped? No, it's worse than we thought. Now what? Well, we've got to do something. What do we do? Vote Democrat. Why? To stop racism. Has it stopped? No, it's even worse than we thought. Now what? We've got to do something. What do we do? Vote Democrat. Why? To stop racism. And on and on and on and on it goes. Every single step with another fundraising email. Over and over again, we're supposed to fall for this. We're told that this stuff is realistic. This is the way the world is when it's totally against everything that I think most people go through on a day-to-day -day basis. If you go back to, you know, there's different parts you can point to as to when this really started to unravel. But like growing up, you know, my little uh, circle of the world, it was one of those situations where racism was a joke. Like I I'd never... No one I knew was a racist. No one ever thought there was real racism in the world. It seemed like this antiquated thing that you'd see on TV in black and white. You know, it seemed like this crazy thing from the past that no one could, could believe was real. And most people, white, black, Hispanic, Asian, just kind of thought of it that way. It was something that shows made fun of and comedians mocked and Everyone thought it was just this dumb, ridiculous thing to laugh at. You know, it's like, it was like, a, you know, the uh, star-bellied sneeches, the Dr. Seuss book, where like everyone kind of had, well, everyone's trying to match up with each other. And one, one side takes the stars off their bellies and the other one puts it on and they can't match. Everyone's trying to match up with each other. And it was just this like dumb analogy for this really stupid thing that cultures did. You know, like it was like, hey, they used to use leeches in medicine. You know, it was like this old thing. And then there's been this sort of renaissance of this as a major problem in our society. Now, look, I'm a kid. I don't necessarily understand everything about racism. I realize it wasn't as gone as I probably thought it was. There's still people out there, certainly, that believe these things. You know, people like David Duke would get on TV and say crazy stuff all the time. But, like, it was very, very small. It was very, very small. And you know what? It wasn't just me who thought that. If you go back to uh, the Obama election... I very much believed Barack Obama would be an absolutely terrible president. By the way, I was right about that. just thought I'd point that out. He was terrible. He had terrible, terrible policies and was a bad president. And many conservatives believe that. I did not want Barack Obama to be elected president. I thought he'd be a bad president. In my view, he was a bad president. But even that night, I remember doing, you know, I was covering the elections in New York City and had to walk to my hotel that night. And I remember walking through the streets and of course everyone in New York is thrilled. You know, they just watched uh, Barack Obama get elected. But they weren't thrilled because of the policies. I mean, that was part of it. They didn't like George Bush. They didn't like John McCain. But what they really did like was the fact that the first black president was elected. And honestly, like, there was a part of me that said, hey, you know, look, for all the bad that he's going to do, he's going to pass a lot of terrible policies, he's going to hurt our country. But at least we won't have this anymore. Whatever remnant of this claim of racism or America's a racist country will be gone forever. We just elected a black president. Uh, you know, states, Indiana voted for him. I mean, like, what, what, what are you going to, uh, come on, seriously? And yet, it had no effect at all. In fact, it did have an effect, but the opposite way. You go back to 2005 and you see that almost all Americans believe racial relations were pretty, pretty good. Americans' already tepid review of relations between white and black Americans have soured since 2018 and is now the most negative of any year Gallup's trend since 2001. The majority of U.S. adults that say race relations between white and black Americans are very or somewhat uh, bad uh, which is 24% for very bad or 31% for somewhat bad. Less than half call them very good, 7%, or somewhat good, uh, which is 37%. But add up the somewhat good and good, very good is 44%. Back in the mid-2000s, that number was 72%. We're going the wrong direction. We're going the wrong direction fast. Shouldn't we be solving this problem, not making it worse? How did this change? Well, we've decided to kind of half implement this Robin D'Angelo, Ibram X. Kendi view of the world. This view that, hey, let's just call all whites racist no matter what they say or do. Just call it core to them. We'll say race is the most important thing to everybody's character and then say that the white race just it produces constantly terrible people who are racist. And we'll say the black race, well, they're just all victims and they can't do anything on their own because of the evil white person. Let's try that out. Well, how does that work for a society? 
How does that work when you implement it widely over a couple hundred million people? What are you going to get? You're going to get good results or you're going to get bad results? It's like we have this human, not American, not white, but human illness of racism, which has uh, existed through all of humanity. And we've all been looking for a cure for it for a very long time. Because honestly, it's so stupid. The idea that you judge someone on the color of their skin is so impossibly dumb, frankly. That's where the, it begins and ends. It's so stupid. It's like judging someone on, based on their eye color. It, it makes no sense whatsoever and never made sense. But you know, a long time ago, some people were pretty simple. And they made really dumb decisions and they thought it was important. And you know what? It's not. So I thought we were getting past that. In fact, I think we were getting past it. We applied this, you know, call it the MLK vaccine. And we sat there and we used this vaccine of what Mar Dr. Martin Luther King prescribed. And he said, here's a solution to it. Everybody ignore race. Treat people like people. Don't worry about what color their stupid skin is. Who cares? It's dumb. And of course, he also had a, a heaping dash of God in there that seems to get ignored from this equation. But that was the concept. That's what the vaccine was made out of. And it was working really well. We were at 72% of people, including, I think it was 66% of, uh, of black people who said, yeah, this is actually, things are going really, really well here. Well, then we decided to, yeah, let's get rid of that vaccine and bring in this new one. We're going to make it out of different ingredients. Now we're going to tell everybody that white people are all racist and black people are all victims. And they're at constant odds. One's oppressing the other. Let's roll that one out into society with no experimentation and see what happens. Well, this is what happens. All the progress that we've made is falling apart because we've decided to implement these progressive, crazy ideas. And you'll recognize this series of events from every major city. You go in there and you implement progressive, crazy ideas and society falls apart. Now we're doing this entirely with our economy, with, with medicine, with uh, racial relations, with, ev with science, with everything all at once. We're trying this ridiculous experiment and it's not going to work. It's not working. It's reversing all the progress we've had, and it's making all the problems that we, we've been dealing with for a long time much, much worse. I got a good idea. Let's pull this one out of the system. Let's go back to the old formula. That one was working. This one is a disaster. Well, we've been talking, uh, we're just talking about uh, vaccines and medicine and what happens if the real medicine that you have today goes away? What if you want some antibiotics, but you can't get them? I mean, this has happened to so many people that I know. They're like, I, you know, I have a medicine for my baby and they need it and I can't get it. I'm driving all over the state trying to hunt this stuff down. This shouldn't be happening in America, but it's already happening a little bit. What happens if there's a, God forbid, there's a war? What if there's some really terrible thing that goes on between America and China or India we're really uh, impl uh, importing a lot of our medication from. What do you do then? Well, why not be prepared? Get the Jace case from Jace Medical. It's a great way to keep yourself prepared for the worst. Uh, you know, we're talking about five courses of antibiotics. This is like a little like, I don't know, I think of it like almost like uh, as a companion to your 24-hour preparation kit, right? Like something hits the fan, you are prepared for stuff like infections and sinusitis and skin stuff and God only knows what other weird problem you might have. Usually antibiotics knock it out. If you don't have the antibiotics, it can get really, really ugly quickly. So don't get caught unprepared. Go to jacemedical.com and enter the code STU at checkout. Promo code is STU at jacemedical.com, J-A-S-E medical.com. It's the Jace case from Jace Medical. I want to bring in Doug Gowdy. Uh, he is the host of WGY Mornings with Doug Gowdy in Albany. Uh, Doug, welcome. So, uh, thanks so much for coming back on the program. Too big day. You were hanging with Megyn Kelly. Now you got me. I mean, if these things come in threes, I think Weird Al Yankovic <laughs> might be in your future. If we continue the trajectory, right? Don't get me too excited. I, I would, that would be that would be the uh, end of an incredibly amazing day, <laughs> Doug. Uh, Doug, you're you're in uh, you're in the middle of this migrant situation in New York, and I I've, I, I want to get your your perspective on this because I find it sort of fascinating to look at from the outside. You know, here being in Texas, you know, we're used to these stories all the time. The border is obviously a big focus of the news on a daily basis, even though I'm, you know, a few hours away from it. It's a huge part of living in Texas, and we're always talking about it. 
And we've always heard from the Northeast that like, oh, that's, you know, you guys are just, you guys hate immigrants, you hate migrants, you don't, you, you don't like people that look different than you. And it's always been a ridiculous argument, but I am fascinated at how quickly this idea of sanctuary cities and we're welcoming people has disintegrated the second a few buses showed up in New York. What's it like there right now? And, and what's the view on the ground? Uh, Mubar is a phrase we use on the radio, messed up beyond all recognition for radio purposes, obviously. Of course. But like, take Erie County, for example, out Buffalo Way. Two months ago, their county executive said, we're a welcoming community. We will make sure everybody is treated properly, is housed, and they're going to become part of the fabric of our community. Less than two months later, they called in the National Guard and said, that's it, no more. Everything we said is now inoperable. We're moving on. You know, here, about five miles up the road from East, there was a town called Rotterdam. So some migrants were bussed up in the middle of the night. Let me give you a kind of idea of the place that they bust them to. When the vans came up earlier that day to get the people that were in there out, because, of course, we had to kick Americans out of the hotel to make room for these migrants. Right. Mm. So when the vans showed up, people thought and the rumor was that they were getting them out of the hotel because they were going to raise the hotel. And everybody was like, yeah, that makes sense. No, it turned out they were just moving migrants into it. It's that kind of place. If you went there right now, Stu, what you would see is police tape and a rope all the way around the front entrance to the parking lot, because apparently it's not a sanctuary hotel. You and I can't get in there. Only the migrants can. Walls for the migrants, apparently, but not for us is the deal. And here's the kicker in, it. in Rotterdam. 30 years ago, a young boy was hit by an ice cream truck and they banned ice cream trucks in Rotterdam. I probably needn't tell you, Stu, what was in Rotterdam last week for the migrant children only. They had an ice cream truck in the parking lot and the kids were out there going, mm -hmm, lovely SpongeBob pop. No one in Rotterdam can get those, but the migrant kids can because the rules don't apply to them in any way, shape or form. You've got to be kidding me. I, I, no, I wish I was. This is really incredible. And like... Look, New York is has made its, you know, these statements of we're accepting, we want people to come here, we're en encouraging it, we're not going to be like these other areas. And I'm fascinated because I honestly, like, as a person who watches this every day, and I know you watch it closely as well, Doug, when the busing started, to me it felt very stuntish. Like, I kind of liked that it made a point that I agreed with, but it was just like a, almost like a political stunt. Hey, why don't you guys have to deal with some of this problem for now? I'm fascinated at how everyone in New York, in Chicago, in D.C., they seem to have no ability to figure out how to do anything with this problem. I, I don't understand how someone like Kathy Hochul makes it through the day when she is on television and seemingly constantly talking about how she can't do this. She can't figure it out. Eric Adams can't figure it out. No one can figure out how to deal with this problem that everyone on the border in the South has had to deal with this entire time. So Kathy Ockel, our governor, made this big pronouncement on Friday last week. And the big pronouncement was that she wrote a very terse letter to Joe Biden saying he's got to step up. And of course, the White House responded and said, pound sand, take it up with Congress, because everybody's pointing fingers at everybody else. Meanwhile, Adams is in Israel right now. He's not even here to be part of this scrum. But she's pointing fingers at Adams. She's pointing fingers at Greg Abbott, the Texas governor. And now she's pointing fingers at Biden. Meanwhile, nothing's getting done. But everyone's going, oh, look at the leadership of Kathy Hochul. She sent out a really terse letter. It's a joke, Stu. I mean, to say the emperor has no clothes is an insult to clothes at this point, because we all knew this was how this was going to go. But to see it just disintegrate so rapidly in front of your face, Mer Eric Adams down in New York City, there's this right to shelter rule that they passed in the city that said anyone that is in New York City's boundaries has a right to shelter. Adams said a couple of weeks ago, that's nice. We're done with that. We're not sheltering anybody else anymore. And until we get some people out of here, nobody's welcome. It was when he was running for office, he put out this big tweet saying, I will forever uphold our sanctuary city status. And now he literally is saying no one is welcome anymore. And they're acting like they still have the moral high ground in all of this. That's what's crazy about it. Kathy Oakle was ripping Greg Abbott going, it's this cheap political stunt that he did. And I'm like, 
Well, who does he get to blame? Because he didn't ask for these people either. And he's getting them tenfold from what we're getting at least. But it doesn't matter. They all just go, ooh, that's a good point. Yeah. And they give a golf clap. And like somehow that solves anything. Yeah. I mean, first of all, obviously a right to shelter law is already, it starts with ridiculous, right? Like you don't know what's going to happen in your society. You could all, you could try to do the best you can to shelter people. But if something like this happens, you're not going to be able to shelter everyone. It's a stupid law to begin with. And like, I, I think it's interesting to dig into how this is happening as well, because at the beginning, yes, it was, you know, it was actually uh, Ducey in Arizona, as well as uh, Abbott in Texas, and, you know, a little bit from DeSantis in Florida of people busing migrants and, and flying them up north. But when the border situation was breaking down a few months ago, the Biden administration made a very specific policy change, which basically to uh, to alleviate the pressure at the actual border, they started talking about allowing people to fly into the cities directly and, and basically incentivized migrants to instead of going to the border and going through that process, just fly into New York, fly into Chicago. You'll be dealt with there. And because there won't be a big buildup, it will be easier and we can just release you into society. So this is happening from all over Central America. They're just flying directly in to these cities from uh, South American cities. And the, the government is allowing this to happen. Instead of trying to make the policies harder on the border, they're just saying skip the border entirely and fly directly to Albany. And now you guys have to deal with it. And it's the whole situation is breaking down even faster than it was before. Kathy Ockel is writing letters to the White House saying, we need work permits waived. We need the 60-day, 90-day, and six-month waiting period so we can figure out who these people are. We want those waived so they can start working immediately. And people are all going, well, wait a second. If they start working immediately, isn't everybody in Texas going to tell Greg Abbott, we want to get to New York now. We're going to have hundreds of thousands more coming up here <laughs> if that were to happen. Somehow Biden understands that, but Kathy Hochul doesn't. And that's their big play, that if these guys somehow are allowed to work right now instead of waiting. I'll give you an example of why that's stupid, Stu. So today, the, the attorney general in New York, Tish James, I think you know Tish James, oh, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. She issued an edict on what the education policy is going to be for these migrant children, because isn't that what the attorney general does is education policy now. Of course. But the Department of Education wouldn't offer up any guidance. So she did. And what she said is, regardless of the, if they can prove residency, regardless of how they got here, and regardless of their vaccinations and immunization shots, we were told everybody was vetted multiple times, but now they're saying, regardless of their shot status, they must be schooled, no questions asked. Stu, do you realize just two months ago, at some SUNY state of New York colleges, kids weren't allowed to participate in their own graduations because they didn't want to get the latest round of alleged booster shots? But now kids are forced to go into schools without immunization records at all because we just we can't figure this thing out in any way, shape or form. Everything's flipped on its head. None of it makes any sense. And yet they act like we're on this, though. We've got this. Mm -hmm. uh, Doug, I, I don't want to sit here and just admire the, the problem here because I, I, you know, I can sit here, honestly, just mouth open, just staring at it and just say, I can't believe this. But is there, we got about a minute left. Is there anything, what do we do here? I mean, is this just a situation where we are completely unprepared and this is just going to keep spiraling out of control? Or is there something that someone can do to stop this? Somebody was saying, you know, the, the preachy Northeast liberals all have all the answers all the time until you actually call them on it. Your governor and, and the governor of Arizona in particular did that. And now they're like, no. So what do they do? They double that on and you guys are the problem. D.C. has no answers. New York City has no answers. Chicago has no answers. I mean, Stu, until the presidential election, I think this is going to continue. Biden has shown you in Harris, to a lesser extent, they have no interest in doing any heavy lifting whatsoever here. And the answer always is with the hard left is if you just throw enough money at it, somehow it's magic fairy dust that will make all the problems go away. They're spending billions of dollars. Eric Adams is asking for $6 billion from the state right now, just for the migrants we have. What do you think? I keep telling people, what happens if we actually do assimilate these people in any meaningful way? You think that's going to be the end of it? Here comes triple that. How much? I, I mean, it's going to bankrupt us unless you get something out of D.C. 
But as I've told you many times, too, when you look to D.C. for guidance, you're in a pretty bad pickle, aren't you? Because there isn't going to be much coming. Remember who's down in D.C., for example, Dan Goldman from New York, George Santos from New York, Chuck Schumer from New York. I mean, that's who's running that place. So where do you turn for answers? You know, in New York, you're not sending us your best. You're sending us, uh, I don't know who you're sending us, but they, they don't represent New York very well. Uh, Doug Gowdy, host of WGY Mornings with Doug Gowdy. Uh, great show and uh, always great perspective coming from New York. Doug, thanks so much for coming on the program. Always appreciate you, Stu. Thanks. Well, Donald Trump has cashed in on the mugshot, as you kind of knew he would. He's not going to just let an opportunity like this go away. Uh, raised $7.1 million after the Georgia booking and mugshot uh, came out. $4.18 million on Friday alone, the single highest 24-hour period of his campaign to date. And that doesn't even count, honestly, like all the other side sites that are also doing this. I mean, you know, it's public domain, basically, so tons of people are selling his stuff, and we will see, uh, you know, I mean, how much you can pull in on this. It's supposed to all go. I know at least the Donald Trump Jr. stuff is supposed to go to the legal defense, so we will uh, we'll see that. I mean, look, it's going to raise a heck of a lot of money, and he's going to need a lot of money to pay these lawyers, not just for himself, but probably some of the co-conspirators as well. Uh, now, we did get an announcement today that the Trump trial date was set March fourth, twenty twenty four. You may know that as a very important day. It is the day of the North Dakota caucus. Mm-hmm. Yep. Oh, yeah. Also, it's the day before Super Tuesday. Uh, so I don't know which one you think is bigger. I mean, I think by that time, Bergamentum really is going to be kicking in. So the North Dakota situation for Trump is going to be very difficult. But I think maybe even Super Tuesday is even bigger. And it's not at all transparent that they're trying to affect the election and the campaign. No way. Putting it one day, I mean, could they be any more obvious? They're putting it one day before Super Tuesday. Why didn't they just start it on Super Tuesday? I guess they have to start it on a Monday. It's the only thing that was holding them back. It really is embarrassing how pathetically transparent this is. Now, Trump, of course, has a lot of things to deal with, not just the legal stuff. He's got to deal with a field of candidates that are trying to become president uh, with varying levels of success. Uh, new poll, a couple of new polls came out today. One show was probably the best one for uh, Ron DeSantis and also Nikki Haley. Uh, Insider Advantage came out with a 2024 Republican primary poll, had Trump at 45, down six points from their previous poll. Ron DeSantis at 18 percent. That's a plus eight from last time they pulled it. Nikki Haley at 11%. First real time you've seen her double digits in any national poll. She's up six points there. Vivek Ramaswamy added a point as well. He's at seven. Everyone else either equal or down. Even Doug Burgum uh, stayed stayed uh, equal. You know, guy got a pretty good record as North Dakota governor and just can only get 1%. It's, it's unfair. And Burgamania will eventually overrun all of this and stop uh, this uh, terrible uh, tragedy uh, from happening. But uh, until Bergen mania takes uh, effect, we'll have to just keep looking at polls from all across uh, the, uh, the, the spectrum. Another one was interesting from the AP, which basically said, hey, um, what do you think of these guys? What do you think of Trump and Biden? Like, wh- how would you describe them? Pres- this is unbelievable. President Joe Biden is, quote, old and, quote, confused. And President Trump is, quote, corrupt and quote, dishonest. Those are the among the top terms Americans use when they're asked to describe the Democrat in the White House and the Republican best position to face him in next year's election. Uh, really all sorts of negative things. Corrupt and crooked for Trump. Uh, 15% said that. Bad and other generally negative comments. Then liar and dishonest. Uh, of course, the you know Biden got all sorts of stuff, including mostly his age. There's an interesting clip uh, on his age uh, from, I think it was CNN this weekend with Dana Bash and J.B. Pritzker. He's the governor of Illinois. And he it, well, he's one of these guys that's been rumored as potentially trying to step in if, if Biden falters. And they asked, uh, Dana asked him about the age question. And his answer, I thought, was really revealing. Listen to this. And the president's age is an issue. It's not us. It's uh, the, uh, the voters who are uh, raising questions about it. He has said, watch me and touts his uh, first term agenda. But Americans seem to be looking for a bit more reassurance. A bit. Is that possible? How should the president handle that? 
Well, again, it's it's him actually accomplishing things that should be proof to people that he's the right man for the job going forward. Uh, nobody talks about the fact that uh, Donald Trump is similar age to mm. uh, to Joe Biden. And uh, and the truth is that what Joe Biden has proven is that that age also brings experience. And one more thing that you should recognize, because you've seen Joe Biden over 50 years now in public life. I know. Here's one thing everybody knows. What? This is a man who brings empathy to oh. everything that he does. Yeah, he was incredible with Maui. Um, it's a fascinating clip. And the reason why I say that is this, this, this argument that he thinks is a good point where he says, you know, no one ever talks about Trump being the same age. That's true. Why? What have you followed up on that thought there, JB? Why? Why don't people say that about Donald Trump? Why don't they say it? They certainly say everything else about Donald Trump. Why don't they say anything about his age? It's certainly not like, well, they don't want to insult him. They want to be too nice to him. Why doesn't anyone mention it? Because it's not an issue. Because no one cares about it. Because he seems to be coherent. Unfortunately for you and your candidate, people are judging him by the job he's doing in the White House, which is why they all think he's asleep all the time. This is kind of a big problem. It's not something being made up. It's not an unfair double standard. It's just that Joe Biden is uniquely unprepared for this job. He is uniquely incapable of doing it when we're talking about major party candidates right now. Everyone else seems to be able to speak. And stand up and not fall over when a light breeze comes by. That's Joe Biden and Joe Biden alone. For years, you've had conversations with people that you know, and they come up to you and they say, hey, did you know my, uh, my nephew? My nephew has become a real estate agent. Well, he's taking real estate classes, and he's going to be great. He's a really nice kid. Would you help him out? I know you're putting your house on the market. Will you help him out? Will you use him as a listing agent? And, like, look, you can do that. That's, but what that is is, a, is a, an a, a exercise in charity. Shouldn't you instead prioritize uh, the best price that you can sell your house for? And then you can give some of that money to charity if you want. That's, that's totally cool. It's a great idea. But... Doing it by just giving some unprepared person um, you know, your biggest financial transaction, that's not something that really should just be asked flippantly at a coffee shop, right? Like, that's a big decision. Instead, you should get a, a screened agent from realestateagentsitrust.com. They put them through, the, they put them through all, all of the tests, uh, performance and you know, personality and how, they, how their ratings are with customer service and what is their record and how much do they know. And they talk to them over and over again. They put them through... All the ringers, and at the end of the day, realestateagentsitrust.com has a list of the best agents in your area. Utilize it. It's free to you. Realestateagentsitrust.com, whether you're buying or selling a home, use it today. Realestateagentsitrust.com. Well, the Canadian teacher who sparked controversy after photos showed her in class wearing Z-size prosthetic breasts. Which I, I don't know. Is that a real size? I, I, think, I thought they were just making it up. Um, her name is uh, Kayla Lemieux. Of course, he, she is a he. It's a dude wearing fake boobs. Um, got kicked out of class largely because eventually there's an uproar in Canada to get her out of class from him out of class. I'm sorry. I, I can't keep track of this crap. But basically, uh, you know, he was acting out some weird sexual fetish, it seemed. Uh, that, now got a new job. Where? Now he's going to be a teacher at another school. With the same school board overseeing them. I, like, how does, this, how does this happen? If you think you, the U.S. is screwed up, a lot of these other countries are even more insane. And uh, Canada seems to be one of them. So, uh, congratulations to Kayla and her Z-cup prosthetic boobs. We've got something really cool coming for you tomorrow on the YouTube page. Go to youtube.com slash America. Click the bell for notifications. Follow the page. You're not going to want to miss it. Again, it's youtube.com slash America. See you tomorrow.